Thank you all. Welcome. Welcome. Um, on behalf of Google.org, Google Health, YouTube Health, I want to welcome you to our National Minority Month, uh, Min National Minority Health Month uh, discussion here today. And for those of you who don't know about National Minority Health Month, we're going to talk a lot about that today. And it's really this observance, um, which seems so much more unique this year than, or this past year than it has before, um, around the issues, challenges, and um, factors affecting minority communities um, and their, their health care in particular. We have just an amazing two set of speakers who have done so much around uh, minority health, health disparities, health equity, have devoted their careers, um, are national leaders um, and longtime national leaders. We're going to get into that um, uh, today that I'm going to introduce further. Um, before, I go, before I go through that, let me take a second to introduce myself. My name is Garth Graham. Um, I am head of um, YouTube Health and what we're doing for health and YouTube. And before um, coming to, to Google and to YouTube, I had a career in the federal government. I was director of the Office of Minority Health um, at uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and then um, worked at CVS Health and in academics as well. And I um, have worked with these giants, these leaders who you're going to hear from um, around issues related to health disparities um, for a long time now. Before I go any further, I should tell you that this, um, you, if you want to submit questions, um, particularly for the second half of our discussion, um, you can submit those through the YouTube chat. Um, and also, you'll see a blue donate button there, and you can click on that um, and donate. Um, um, and 100% of those proceeds uh, will go to the CDC uh, Health Foundation. You hear a little bit more about the CDC Foundation work and some of the amazing things that they've been doing to advance issues around uh, health equity for our country um, for some time now. So uh, with that being said and done, let me uh, bring up our two guest panelists while I, I try to humbly um, speak about them. But I mean, these are um, two of the leaders that really have been blazing the path um, way before the issue of health disparities um, became, um, uh, you know, part of the national discourse as it is, as it is now and are some of the giants that Many of us are standing on their shoulders. So um, the first of those guest panelists is when I say I, um, I, try, I think of her of one of the um, OGs um, of this issue of health disparities and health equity. Um, the Honorable uh, Do the Dr. Donna Christensen. She retired from the U.S. House of Representatives um, a couple of years ago after serving nine terms. That's 18 years. Um, she was the first female physician to serve as a member in the history of the U.S. Congress and during her tenure, she did so many amazing things moving forward the issue of, of minority health and health disparities. Like I said, before it was, um, you know, as 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 public as it is now, you know, when it was a harder fight to do, and we're going to talk about that. She um, prior to her election, she um, was a, a, in family practice and had done a number of things um, um, on the local level. But just again, I kind of tell you that. The, the, the privilege we have of hearing from the Honorable um, uh, Dr. Donna Christensen here today. Equally as privileged, I would yes. say, which, which are, um, is uh, Dr. Lawrence Smith, who is the Chief Health Equity and Strategy Officer for the CDC Foundation. And in that role, um, Dr. Smith is bringing, you know, almost three decades worth of experience around the intersection of healthcare delivery, management policy, and public health. And she has had a long history as well of um, dealing with issues around racism um, and issues impacting vulnerable populations from her work um, as interim commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of, of Public Health um, and all of her work she did around reducing infant mortality um, and her work at uh, the uh, Boston Medical Center. So um, really what I want the audience to get a sense of here, um, and I'll try to say this, um, I would have said this anyway, um, is the, is the, the the degree, experience, track record, um, and again, way before it became popular, um, these were the folks who were blazing the, the trail, leading the path, um, and you know now many of us are talking more about this in particular this year. But um, I want I, you know you hear more from their experiences about what it meant to be fighting in the you know fighting the good fight um, in the dark, um, you know um, when people weren't um, having CNN talks about it and it wasn't a part of. The mainstream news, but um, was a part of what our, our country and our community needed. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Christensen. And I did refer to you as a OG 
uh, within this issue of health disparities, and that's meant to recognize your long tenure. Can you start off by telling folks a little bit about yourself, but the things you worked on, I want to say back in the day, but it's not so much back in the day, but it was the building blocks for where we are now and um, what you saw then and just how um, you advanced policy, um, especially around this issue around um, minority health and health disparities. Well, thank you. And God, uh, I think you're not giving yourself enough credit for the work that you did while at the Department of Health, uh, Health and Human Services, and of course, before and since. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, starting with Minority Health Month, um, that was uh, something that uh, JC Watt and I had discussed, and we got it done in we introduced it in April of April 25th, I think, of 2002, and it was passed by the end of the month, at least in the House, and then the Senate passed it later. So that was about the easiest thing that we did, because nothing, nothing at all was easy. The first issue that I was involved in as I came in, and Maxine was the chair, was the Minority AIDS Initiative. And I worked with Maxine and Lou Stokes, um, who um, the, really led the effort. I was, I was just there helping. I was the gopher. I was the person that just, you know, did anything they needed me to do to, to assist in, the, in uh, on that issue, and and that was a that was a tough sell. We wanted a state of emergency for um, HIV and AIDS in the African American community. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services was not supportive of of that at all. Uh, we would go out and speak and, and they would come behind and say, you know, no, we're not going to do it. Uh, but we always had people on the inside of the department, like you were when you got there. And, and they helped and helped us strategize. And at the end of the year, uh, we had a severe and ongoing, a declaration of a severe and ongoing crisis. And we had $152 or $58 million dollars just for HIV and AIDS in the minority community. And that was um, that was unprecedented at that time that you would have funds targeted to minority communities. And we continue to, of course, increase it from there. Uh, that also was some of the easier <laughs> things that we did. Um, moving the center, moving the Office of Minority Health Research at NIH was a tougher sell. Um, we um, started with uh, one director at the time, and it was an office, and they were in the office of the director of NIH, and uh, we wanted them to have more independence, and so we decided we would, um, I worked with John Ruffin back then, another giant um, in healthcare, um, who's now re uh, retired, but still active in the effort. Um, so we went through the first uh, director who adamantly opposed it. The second, we had Dr. Kirstein who came in as an interim and she opposed it as well, but we were able to get through to her and she finally said, okay, we'll do it. But John, this Congressional Black Caucus and, and myself, we decided to do it in legislation so that it would have the authority and the permanency that um, it needed. And so we did that and we got, but you know, just getting to, it was, we put it on the suspension calendar and I'm gonna stop after this one and we'll talk about some of the other stuff. We put it on the suspension calendar and of course it was the Center for Minority and Health Disparity Research and someone in one of the parties, which will remain nameless, <laughs> um, decided that the word minority, they didn't like the word minority and they had it pulled while we were on the floor getting ready to, to you know, debate it. And um, I, it was very early in my tenure and I was like, I'm gonna call a press conference and I'm gonna make a lot of noise about this and I, I told John Lewis what had happened and he said, no, let me try to work on this uh, before you do anything <laughs> rash, you know? And so he and JC Watt 
work behind the scenes and we got it back on the calendar that day and passed that day. But those are the kinds, some of the kinds of things that we had to go through to get things done. We, we can talk about some of the others later let's, on. Let's just, just, just to breeze over a lot of things you breezed over with history lesson for people there. You know, talking about the work of the, the great um, uh, Congressman John Lewis, great Congressman Lewis Stokes. Lewis Stokes, who yeah. set, who laid the foundation for a lot of the things that we were able to build upon. Yes. Yep. And all of these people, and so for, for folks who are listening, these may be names you're hearing for the first or second, or not John Lewis, but maybe others, you know, for the first and third time. I really, I really implore people to, I hate to say this from Google, Google it. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, find out more because this is the history of how health inequities were, were dif, 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 dealt with. And you know what? Dr. Christensen just kind of breezed through in her first couple of minutes there was how she helped create this month, how you know, the, the pushback there was, the, the, the environment was not conducive to this happening. So just the, 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 the force in her leadership. So I'm going to say this because you can't say this for yourself. Um, but the force in her leadership, the, the, the navigation behind the scenes, you know, how the Congressional Black Caucus played such an important role. And the, the reason I say I wanted to take a second to just, you know, emphasize that is a lot happened back then to get us to where we are now. We don't even have these kinds of conversations. Um, and people just don't know that. And so to be able to talk with, you know, um, someone of your stature today and someone of your stature too, Dr. Smith, who will switch you in a second, is, is really what I want the audience to get away and the history of what you bring to the table. Um, Don, at some point, I expect to, to um, uh, 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 go to sidebar, but they always say give people their roses while they're, while they can, while you can give it to them. And so I wanted to specifically say that about your work, the Congressional Black Caucus work, um, um, you know, Congressman Lewis, um, Congressman Stokes, um, you know, Congressman Jackson, you know, all of those people um, um, who, who laid a lot of foundation back then. Switching now to, to Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, you have been on the forefront of this issue of disparities and how it affects particularly pediatric population, infant mortality, child disparities, and you know, even from your time back in Massachusetts um, and what was happening in Boston Medical Center has always been the forefront of kind of ground zero for health disparities, um, certainly in, in the state of Massachusetts, but, but, but even in terms of from a clinical and poly per policy perspective. So you've seen it. Um, tell us a little bit about you know, your experiences, what this month means to you around um, National Minority Health Month and how you have seen um, both in the, the things you've observed in your careers and the things you have done, how you have seen things either slowly progress or not progress over time. Well, thank, thank you for that. And I just wanna, you know, um, add to your admiration for Dr. Christensen that, you know, it sounds like she was uh, taking John Lewis's, you know, famous advice of getting in good trouble. Um, so it seems like you were, that's what you were up to uh, in the Congress and, and we're so grateful to you for that. Um, Garth, I, I think I, I would start by saying, um, I, I have been called to this work. I mean, and I, I use that term, you know, the, that, that terminology purposefully because it does feel like a calling, like a an opportunity to contribute. And one of my my favorite quotes is this. Um, it's been uh, attributed to several different people, but I like it regardless. Which is, service is the rent you pay for living. Mm. Mm. And and to my mind, that is sort of what has motivated me. I think in terms of this particular issue around health inequities. There's so many levels that it it can appeal um, from a, a moral or philosophical or even religious one um, in terms of not having people suffer um, with you or near you when you could do something. But it also has a very pragmatic and practical aspect, um, which is that our country can't be healthy and productive and competitive if our neighbors aren't allowed to reach their full potential because of totally preventable health inequities. Like it's, it's not good economic practice. It's not good governance. It's not, you know, so from my mind, the importance of Minority Health Fund is that it, it has elevated and continues to elevate those kinds of questions. I think now we are at the, the, 
kind of um, a crossroads in a way where we might have to think about reframing this because, mm -hmm. you know, right now, as of right now, young people of color are already past the 50 percent proportion in, in the United States. And, you know, depending on, you know, the estimates, it looks like 2030, 2040, the United States is going to be a majority people of color nation. So people of color aren't going to be minority. We're in fact going to be majority. So the importance of Minority Health Month becomes that's going to be U.S. Health Month, mm. Mm. right? Because if we continue to allow preventable, I keep underscoring preventable, preventable health inequities to persist in, in groups of folks who will be the majority of the country, that's just not smart. You could just, it's not, you could talk about it, it's not moral, it's not ethical, it's all those things too, but it's just not smart either. Um, so that's where I've sort of been been coming from this. And certainly as a pediatrician and public health official, I the last thing I would say is I'm also a, a, a mother and a wife and a daughter and a sister and all those different roles in terms of how people experience health and well-being. Um, have played a role into how I've approached it. And, and I'm sure as, as Dr. Christensen would observe, also taking care of families at Boston Medical Center and, and having the honor and the privilege of being, of having a window into their lives at a incredibly stressful and difficult time. I mean, when people's kids are sick and hospitalized, and I only took care of people that were kids that were in the hospital, that was the basis of my work. That's not a good time for families. I mean, that's that's incredibly stressful. So witnessing both what they were experiencing during that time and what got them there, like what were the social and economic conditions that led to their children being ill in the first place? You can't observe that for very long and not have it then galvanize you for wanting to say, well, I can contribute as a clinician, but I can contribute perhaps even more in a public health role or as Dr. Christensen did, in an elect as an elected official looking to change the underlying or to affect the root causes of why those children were getting sick in the first place. So that's what's what's galvanized me is is really keeping an, an eye on that prize and, and feeling like that's my calling to to do that. Can I just jump in on, on that issue? You know, um, I was a family physician. So when you take care of several generations of, of families also, and mostly outpatient, but I did inpatient also, you really end up dealing with all of the factors that are influencing their lives, making them ill or just, sometimes they just come in just to talk, you know? so. I often used to say that I took my office, my little office practice in St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands and, you know, took it to a, a, a national stage. And I'm very fortunate to be a member of the Congressional Black Caucus because without them, a person who was a delegate from a little dot in the ocean that most people don't can't find um, to be given a national voice was really um, attributed to to the Congressional Black Caucus. And I can't say enough about what a privilege it was to work with them. And I'm going to throw some more color on that too, Dr. Christian. I'm going to come to you guys next about asking you who inspired you to do what you do. But before I go there, mm -hmm. I'm going to give some, some folks some more background before I ask you all that question. And one of the things Dr. Christensen described to you all was what she did with the National Institutes of Health. What you have to understand here is all of the research you're seeing that people are doing, or much of the research you're doing um, around health disparities, that comes from funds from the government. Um, not all, but a big chunk of it, I should say. And what they were able to do there, Dr. Christensen, Dr. Stokes, uh, 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 Congressman <laughs> and others, um, 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 was to, to elevate that as a National Institute of Health so that you're seeing the domino effect that we're seeing across the world now. And part of why I want to emphasize that is a lot of things happening now, many of us take as given. You know, we just assume all of these things are happening because somebody decided to do the right thing and it all happened. But that's not how it occurred. There was a time period where people were fighting legislative battles, where 
you know, fighting policy battles, you know, building the 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 um the 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 building blocks and then now you're able to have these conversations and in light of what you see happening with covid and its effect on black and brown communities again all of this seems um in retrospect as if it just all should have happened but none of that happens um that way it happens by blood sweat and tears and again you know you guys are the folks who put in the blood sweat and tears i want to recognize that but let me go back since um i have uh, i have a couple of minutes where i get to ask all the questions for myself and all the things i've always wanted to know um I want to hear from you too about what inspired you to get into this work. And before you answer that, I'll tell you that you two have inspired so many um, black and brown physicians to take on leadership roles, to do things both clinically and non-clinically. Um, and one of the things I, I learned from, from, from watching folks like you is how to navigate the system in terms of getting things done. But I'm curious to know, you know, what were the sparks in your professional careers um, where you said, you know what? I think I'm going to run for elected office, or you know what? I think I'm going to get involved in the bigger issues affecting the state of Massachusetts, and I'm going to put my career on the line because you risk your career, right? If things don't work, um, you know, it's not as if again these are these seem like foregone conclusions, but they weren't then. Um, so, what were the things that gave each of that inspired each of you? Was there a magic moment where you said, you know, I'm going to do this? Um, and then what kind of propelled and pushed you through? Who wants to go first? You, you, you go can first. go. You go uh, well, you know, I'm going to go back to when I was in college. I, I, when I was in college, I started out studying to be a medical technologist. And um, I had a friend who was in pre-med. And somehow some booklets were shared with us from the United Negro College Fund. And I picked one up to send to him and I read it and it was saying how much the country needed African-Americans to go into the field of medicine. Mm -hmm. And after reading that, the next day I changed my mind and I went into pre-med. Mm -hmm. So it started really back then running for office. I, you know, I was a community activist at home more while I was practicing running for office was not something I had actually planned to do. Um, I worked behind the scenes. I worked with the Democrat Party and um, getting other people elected. But when the seat became vacant, I, I was really pressed to run, thinking that I was going to go and take care of my constituents. I wasn't even thinking about being, you know, having a national, any kind of national impact. Um, but I had promised my patients as I was leaving, which was a very difficult decision to make, um, uh, and that I would still focus on healthcare. Mm. And um, just the issues that you know I saw in my practice and that were continuing. And then when the AIDS activists came and started to show us how devastating that was to our communities, I guess that just kind of took off from there. We're going to come back to, to HIV AIDS and the struggles early on. Um, again, people think things are the way they are now, how they've always been, but it took a lot to get that going. going. Um, uh, Dr. Smith, how about you? Well, I, I actually took a, a little bit of a different path. I actually worked in government before I went to medical school. I was a, mm. I was a policy analyst in um, health and human services in the you know, every one of the cabinet um, uh, offices has a uh, office of inspector general, which looks at it, things interior and does policy mm -hmm. analysis. And so that's where I worked right out of college. Um, so I had an opportunity to sort of think about how medicine and health works from the outside before I went to medical school. I always knew I was going to go, but I, I wanted to experience that first. I think that that was really helpful at cementing for me that I was always going to have one foot in, you know, different kind of camps, if you will, that are, you know, the practice part and the delivery of healthcare, but the really important part of what are the, the social and public policies that affect how people live, um, because that is such a, a, uh, substantial and you know much more um, influential uh, impact on whether or not people are healthy. Not to say that healthcare is not important, but it's not the primary driver. 
And so I wanted to be able to affect both. So I think that that's how I, how I got there. And I, and I would send mine back to college too, uh, Dr. Christensen, because I um, was a biology major. But my, the way it worked was I, um, I took a sociology class and a public and a political theory class. And it just mm-hmm. kind of blew my mind. And, and I, from that moment on, I was like, okay, I'm going to need to do both of these things. So I became the biology major who was, you know, studying microeconomics and political theory. And, <laughs> you know, so and, this- and when I started, when Lou Stokes retired and I, I was given the honor of chairing the health brain trust for the CBC, um, everybody wanted, all of our sponsors wanted us to talk about disease, diseases. And I was mentored by a lot of wonderful people who um, helped me to see what was beneath all of those diseases that were causing these preventable um, deaths and morbidity in our community. So gradually we moved away from diseases or very early on and started to look at some of those, um, the, the social determinants of health. Uh, and that's where our focus has been. If it were, if we had changed, which we still have to do, and I don't know where that, you were in that where that's coming from. If, if we can change those, that's what's going to make the difference. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what's going to make the difference. We know yes. how to treat. We know how to treat diseases. We know how to prevent diseases. But if people live in circumstances that don't support their better health and face discrimination in the healthcare system, the, you know, we're not going to be able to change anything. So we're gonna, let, let's go, let's jump to that. Uh, although I do want to, to recognize, we've been throwing around a lot of names, uh, particularly we're talking a lot about Congressman Lou Stokes. And for those of you, again, I'm, uh, I'm a student of history and having been there with Dr. Christensen, I watch all this happening. Congressman Lou Stokes was a, Congressman from Ohio, his brother was Carl Stokes there. They were a combination of power in the black community for the state that did amazing things, but they were also very strategic. And one part of the Congressional Black Caucus was the Health Bridge Trust where um, the congressional leaders, Black Hawks leaders who were interested in health would strategize around policy and again, move things forward. And we would not be talking about National Minority Health Month today if it wasn't for Dr. Christensen, a congressional Black Caucus, Brain Trust, and everything that happened there. And I I was watching it firsthand. Um, and again, I hate to say this five times over, but <laughs> we're never a foregone conclusion. You know, they just people you know, no. like, well, I hear things on TV and you know, people say stuff, and I'm like, no, that's not what happened back then. You know, people had to people had to press on and you know press through and, and all of that. But I get out, let me get off that tangent and keep us focused because there's a lot we could talk about. You two both talked about the fact that there are um, factors driving health that are not necessarily based in um, one specific disease. And COVID-19 and the impact it's had on Black and Brown communities have made people focus on COVID-19 and impact on the Black and Brown communities um, without thinking through how did we get here? What are the underlying causes? You know, that the COVID-19 pandemic is just a symptom on top of the problem. Mm-hmm. I'm interested to hear from both of you um, what you think are some of those driving factors that led to the differential impact of COVID-19 um, on black and brown communities. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to begin. And I would just, just say, and I, I know you both would agree that it is not surprising to anyone who's been in public health that, there, that COVID-19 has just wreaked havoc in populations of color. You know, people, you might see sometimes in the news, like, oh, that's such a surprise, or, oh, my gosh, we didn't mm-hmm. anticipate that. That's not true for those of us who've been in this work. We could have told you that, you know, on February 2nd, if this expands, this is it's going to play out this way in these communities because we know how every other, you know, health condition has played out in those same communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the issues that you're going after are things like, why why do folks have a, a heavier burden of of chronic disease already mm. what what is, what is already um, burdening our communities with chronic disease um, increased rates of heart disease and stroke and um, different kinds of cancers and and diabetes all of those put you at risk 
for having worse outcomes with COVID. And those were already high in our communities because we have issues around stress. We have issues around the experience of racism in everyday life. We have issues around d inadequate access to affordable food that's healthy. We'll have an abundance of fast food restaurants that are high in sodium and fat and everything else. But we, we have communities that have no grocery store, right? Because they, they haven't been, there's been no grocery store that's been situated there. Um, we have communities where they don't have any work flexibility, right? They have to go to work. They work in kinds of jobs that don't have sick leave. If they don't go to work, they don't get paid, which then means puts them at risk for house, you know, losing their housing or not being able to buy food for their family. So they have to go to work, whether or not they're, they feel well or not. So, you know, we could, I'm sure, you know, Dr. Christian, you guys could go on and on for all the different things. Housing. Absolutely. Segregated housing and all of the structures that limited where people of color could live have resulted in segregated communities that have mm. been systematically disinvested. So the quality of the housing is poor. It's more congested and crowded because people's wages are low because, again, of racism and discrimination and also the concentration in low paying jobs. Families have to be kind of doubled up. This was especially hard on um, uh, Latinx uh, families um, across the country who might live in more um, multi-generational households and, and in more, more kind of uh, crowded conditions. Mm -hmm. And that is a recipe for, you know, disaster in an infectious disease situation where, where things are, are conveyed that way. So almost every aspect, you know, education, food, Absolutely. housing, work, employment, um, pollution, uh, exactly where are where are communities of color they're much have higher rates of air pollution they have higher rates of ground pollution higher rates of lead poisoning so the these non-random patterns of exposures and risks and and patterns of disinvestment that put these communities at risk for all of the other things you could almost close your eyes and say is there an inequity in fill in the blank and the answer would probably be yes, mm -hmm. because of all those structural or those root causes that have um, made it harder to be healthy. It's mm. made it it's made it harder to attain health. Um, so oh. that's what I would say about that. This is not a surprise. And, this is this and is all of, yeah, all of, yeah, all of those things that you mentioned actually affect our bodies. Exactly. Exactly. They affect the, our physiology, the neural, our neural, neural, neural system. You know, it really takes a toll. And that toll makes us more susceptible to disease. Uh, well, yes, yeah. totally agree. I, I, one, one, one thing I heard um, that's, you know, the COVID pandemic has decreased life expectancy overall in the U.S. by one year. The first time you've had that, you know, happen in decades. For black and Latinx communities, it's two years. Mm. One of the, the barriers that, or barriers, one of the challenges that happened with the vaccine rollout, as you recall, was, you know, people over 75. At first blush, that seems like, okay, that seems reasonable. We know older people were struggling more with this. If you look at the distribution of the population, black and brown people are less likely to live past 75. So there was a lower yes. portion of mm. people who were in that age category to get vaccinated. So you don't think of something like an age, you know, an age cutoff as being potentially problematic. But if if all those other factors that we were just talking about lead to lower life expectancy anyway, then you're not gonna have enough people, you're not gonna have as many people in that age group to even qualify for vaccines at the beginning of the process. Yep, yep. And it, Native Americans and Alaska Natives also, Yes, their life expectancy is low as well, and and so you yes. find that same phenomenon, same pattern, there. same pattern. Yeah. Dr. Christensen, when you were dealing with coming up with a comprehensive response from the government around for HIV/AIDS, you were seeing a lot of the things that Dr. Um, Smith has described, and it's funny. I just remember all of those conversations. You know, um, you know the the, the, the 
the poor polls were talking about with the environmental justice movement, all of these things mm -hmm. that into beer. Are there things you did in making those efforts successful? Because they were, you know, what the Congressional Black Caucus did for HIV AIDS in the black and brown communities, black and brown communities was significant, which again, I want to recognize all of these things. But were there, were there key things you learned about tackling that issue that we should think about here in terms of how you thought through um, and you and the rest of the, the, the leaders thought through those challenges? Are there things that we need to bring to bear now as we think through issues around the health disparities and even COVID? Well, you know, we didn't do it by ourselves, not even just the Congressional Black Caucus. We had uh, our Health Brain Trust brought people from across the country mm. to also have a voice and help us help to guide what we were doing as members of Congress. We tried to leave every Health Brain Trust with uh, an agenda item that we would focus on and try to turn into legislation or just policy one way or the other. And what came out of that was our Health Equity and Accountability Act, right. where we try, that started back in 2003, where we tried to bring all of the issues together that we felt would have the, the impact that was needed to begin to reduce the disparities and bring about health equity. 2003, we finally got our first hearing probably around 2009 and then came healthcare reform. And what we did, again, talking with all of our partners who sometimes we had to call on to put some pressure on their representatives um, we had to do that with the Office of Minority Health Funding a couple of times, if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so what we did was as a tri-caucus, come together and develop some benchmarks and insist that health equity had to be addressed in the ACA. And so, I mean, from 2003 to 2010, and not everything that we actually put in the bill has been actually implemented. Yeah. So we still have work to do. Yeah, man, I remember the bill always being reintroduced again. <laughs> you remember House that? and Senate, I, yes. All the time and a recurrent issue. And again, you know, the fact I just, I just, I, a student of history, I just when I think through how you all were persistent, waiting for timing, and then when the ACA came, being able to you know, uh, move everything forward with their We, we tried to put as much as we could from our Health Equity and Accountability Act into into the um, Affordable Care Act. Yep. And that's that's how you strategize and make progress. Um, so let me talk a little bit about, uh, ask you to a little bit about the future and what you see next. And Dr. Smith, I'm going to ask you to start off with, from two perspectives, from your you as someone who's been in this area for a long time, and then also from the CDC Foundation's land. Um, what do you see as the, what do you and the CDC Foundation, but maybe separate as well, see as exciting things going forward that are glimmers of hope um, that we can can tie to? And then Dr. Chris, I'm gonna ask you, ask you that as well. And the reason I say this is, you know, we have, especially in the era of um, increased attention to racial injustices. We've seen a, sometimes a repetition of the challenges um, and not, not, not a, fear, a feeling of forward movement. And I'm interested in seeing like, what do you guys see on the, certainly on the health disparities perspective of as, 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 as glimmers of hope um, in either you know, projects, people, things that you're seeing happening out there in the ground that show, show that there is a, f a future that we can think through more optimistically um, as opposed to um, kind of repetitive challenges? Well, I think, I think that that's a great question and, it, and I think it does open us. I mean, one can have a, a sense of optimism, I think, for, for several reasons. One is we are now having conversations and addressing and uncovering issues and problems, not that weren't talked about before, but the the frankness and the, the bluntness almost and the um, the recognition that we have to do a real reckoning and acknowledgement 
of all of the the history. I think that before sometimes the conversation was, well, let's let's try to fix this without going deep to understand how we got there. And I think people recognize now that you can't you can't get to lasting action without that first going through that stage as uncomfortable and frankly painful mm -hmm. as it can be, which is that reckoning of what past harm has happened. Um, and I think we see this in healthcare, we see this in public health, we see this in government. Um, so I think that that's important. Now it's not sufficient. So don't, you know, I'm not, you know, Pollyanna and saying like, oh, now that we're doing that, like it's all gonna be easy. I don't believe that's the case, but the fact that we're even having a conversation to talk about structural racism. When I went to public health school, we talked about social terms of health, but no one was at that point talking about structural institutional racism mm -hmm. that was that was, you know, integrated into the very fabric of how society runs. We're we're doing that now, which I think mm -hmm. is really important. So I think that that's important, and it's a. a organization like the, the 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 CDC Foundation now has a role like mine. I mean, this is a new role that I'm in. The Chief Health Equity and Strategy Officer start, you know, started last fall. Um, we have a, an entire um, equity strategy and vision and set of principles about how we as a foundation are going to do our work and how that's going to evolve. Um, and that means we're going to be partnering with folks differently. We're going to be thinking about projects differently. Um, not that we haven't done it in the past, but we have an opportunity to really, to grow that and intensify that in a more um, conscious and intentional way. Um, and I think that that consciousness and that intention is gonna be really important. And the last thing I would say is that we have a increased recognition that accountability is really important. Mm -hmm. So I think that people are like, yeah, I'm all done with the talk. Like talk, 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 talk. Um, what's the accountability? How are we going to know that we're moving? And and who's going to hold us accountable? And, and how are we going to measure and sort of come back to that? And I think that we're not going to be allowed off the hook, perhaps, um, in perhaps some of the ways that, you know, 20 or 30 years ago might have happened. Um, and I think that's for a lot of reasons. So all of that really excites me and the fact that we have an opportunity at the foundation really to put our money where our mouth is literally um, and invest in community-based organizations and other kinds of partners who are working to change that fabric at the community level, um, I think is really exciting. You know, um, um, whenever I get into conversations like these, I can go on and on because there's so much to learn. We do have questions from the audience. Um, we do. Um, um, and so I want to take a couple of those, although I do want to come back to the issue of vaccine equity. So we'll circle back to that somehow before okay. um, before we end. And um, Well, that's to, the topic of the hour. That's the boy, topic oh of boy. the hour. Um, but um, yes, yeah, if we could um, take the the first audience question, this is from Sei Huen. Um, and it's, uh, the, her, the question is, how do you all think about the intersection of additional identities and marginalized communities in the context of minority mm -hmm. minority health. Oh, good question. For example, trans healthcare. And I think the, the root of this question is how do we think about um, uh, health disparity populations overall? And I, I guess part of this would be are we limiting it or are we thinking through, you know, um, um, how the issue affects all communities that um, um, bear a disproportionate and or, or disenfranchised uh, communities. Yeah, um, as you know, I, I've been on the health equity task force that Google is um, really the lead uh, supporter of with uh, your next uh, speaker for one of these talks. And um, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about that because we really have to look not only at Black, Hispanic, Native Americans, but we, there are a lot of other subpopulations within all of those um, that we need to you know, zero in on because it's not a none of those larger groups are monolithic they're all have many different people that we have people with disabilities we have tr people who are trans we have um, so we have really started to take a look at that and um, I think that's something that you will find that that task force will contribute 
a, a great deal to in, in looking at intersectionality and the smaller populations within the larger groups. Well, one thing I would just add to that quickly is there's a, a wonderful piece that um, Angela Glover Blackwell, who was the founder of Policy, oh, yes. uh, yeah. wrote uh, the curb cut effect. And essentially she argues that when you organize sort of policies and approaches that address the needs of folks who have been marginalized or excluded, not only does that benefit them, but it ends up benefiting the whole community and the whole society. And so she uses the example of curb cuts that were, you know, initially, you know, brought to bear for, for folks with movement, you know, issues who might be in wheelchairs, et cetera, but what were helpful for people delivering things and people with luggage and people with strollers and a whole That's host true. of other things. So it's, um, I think that point to the question of is you can understand what would be helpful to those who've been most excluded, chances are the benefits will be be experienced across a, a broader a broader swath. But going there to understand that first. And, and much like the, the leaders here um, with Dr. Smith and Dr. Christensen, there's a Dr. Um, Rachel Levine is, um, um, uh, there's a new assistant secretary for health has been breaking down some amazing barriers around trans health and um, is a, for one of the first, I think, she, I think she is the first federal government leader, um, um, in general, trans federal government leader. So just, I think we're seeing progress. We're not as fast as we would like to, but I, th I think um, certainly the, 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 the issue of disparities um, really encapsulates how all communities are disproportionately impacted. All right. Um, I have I have already done a bad job as a moderator, but <laughs> to run out of time. Um, so let's take the um, second question, um, if we may. And this is from um, Jeremy Sussman. The amazing work that Dr. Chris has described seems impossible in today's political reality. I have to jump in and answer this question first. But I want to tell you from watching it what it was like. Now, the amazing work that Dr. Christensen described seems impossible in today's political reality. What can we do about the the, the, the Senate um, intransigence? Very good question, uh, Jeremy. Let me just say one thing. Back then, it was worse. And part of why, I did, that's my viewpoint, it's not, not only were things polarized, but the ability to talk about these issues, um, you know, even, in, even, even within circles you think would be conducive to it. Um, we're still challenging. And so there were a lot of uphill battles in general. Now, granted, times certainly feel a lot more polarized, but anyway, I, I'm answering this question for Dr. Christensen when honestly, I just saw her navigate um, uphill, a hill that seems steeper than that now, but 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 let me let me let you answer the question, Dr. Christensen. I, I still think it was a, a lot different back then. When I when I first came into Congress, we we actually had bipartisan retreats where Republicans and Democrats would would uh, retreat together. We had our individual ones, but we we had that. We had a women's caucus that was bipartisan that really worked very very well together. We'd identify common issues that we could all support, and we would get things done. Um, it, it's much more difficult right now, and. Um, I, it started to change about halfway through. Mm. Um, it just is going to uh, mean that those who are on the outside are going to have to be much stronger advocates for health equity and re you know reduction of health disparities, the changes that, that need to take place in communities of color and rural communities. Uh, so we're gonna have to have much more um, activism and advocacy to help us get get through and we're gonna have to probably do some uh things that you know like uh pass things by reconciliation or or deal with the filibuster things that um we really may not would not want to do but the issues that need to be addressed are so critical that i think it's going to require that Let's take um, one more question. I want to try to um, make some time to get back into the vaccine discussion. Um, and so after this next question, let's take one more question. I do want to um, uh, get into that a little bit. So this question is from um, uh, uh, Jared Moljo. Thank you, Jared. And it said, how are you trying to address problems of, peop of people of color not being believed when they go into the doctor? Even for, that's such a good question. 
even for people like um, Serena Williams, who should have the money to get the best healthcare. Now, add on to your question, Jared. You know, there was a, there was um, even a stories, and one was a, a clinic a physician who who died um, from uh, COVID and felt like her while she was going through the process felt like her care was not being adequately taken care mm -hmm. of. She was a literally a physician, you know, from the community, um, and that's a separate story, but related. I think that the question is is you know. Um, you know, how do we deal with the intrinsic bias that definitively impacts um, how um, how seriously um, the complaints, the, the concerns um, of people of color um, are both in the clinical setting and I would say a broader, but um, again, uh, I'm interested in both of your answers. Well, I'm, I'm going to go and maybe say something a little bit sort of controversial and, and send people to... Okay. to observe what is happening in the wake of the, I think, uh, unfortunate, but very illustrative issue that happened at JAMA about their, their podcast related to structural racism. So the idea that I think a very well, not just very well regarded, one of the pinnacles of the medical literature, you know, would, would say, would advertise something and say that physicians can't be racist, so how can there be structural racism? Oh my goodness. Right, so there's been a whole fallout for that, and I'm sure Garth has been following it, that has, again, not, not it's uncovered or it's, a, it's intensified the scrutiny, I think, of medicine looking at itself, like mm. a wake-up call, another aha moment when JAMA, JAMA, is having to address the fact that it it wasn't talking about structural racism, it was in fact illustrating it. And so to my mind, to answer the question, I think that we've had lots of conversations around you know, how to do cultural competence and, and how to increase you know, um, the numbers of uh, uh, people of color in medicine, which are really important. But if the structural framing of how that, what gets into the literature, how that is controlled, how people are taught, what are they taught? What are the algorithms that are being used to assess whether or not someone's renal function is normal or not? And are there inherent biases in those sorts of things? We could have you know, a lot of cultural competency training. And if, those, if that structural stuff is still there, then that's what's gonna be problematic. So I would say the fact that now there's a whole group of black women physicians who sat down and, you know, to meet with JAMA after all this played out and they're like, you know, we're, we're watching, you know, we're not, we're not going to just kind of go off quietly into the night. So I'm actually feeling hopeful that this, I think, unfortunate incident um, or episode is going to, you know, galvanize or, or, you know, catalyze people to just say, you know, enough is enough medicine. We got to get after this. Yeah. Um, two things. One is the need to have more physicians and faculty of color. You have to be able to be among people to develop that co co cultural competency. I don't think, I really don't think it can be taught. You have to right. be there. And uh, yeah, and the other thing is that we've seen that, uh, and I, I talked about the weathering and the fact that the the stresses that we go through have really changed our physiology. It, it has passed on to generations. So we see um, Af African American women who are well educated, high income, still having some of the same outcomes that a poor woman, you know, who may not have had the opportunities would have. Um, so the, the issues of the social, economic, environmental determinants and the stresses that that causes transfers to people, even once they've, um, they're not no longer poor, they're, they're wealthy, they, they have all of the opportunities. We still see some of those uh, same um, health right. disparities. Right, and the structural racism that, you know, would prevent someone from taking in the information from a mother that says, I have 
I can't breathe or I'm having chest pain or whatever, and poo-pooing it versus mm. taking it as really, you know, vital information. Yeah, That's and the black, black women are the ones that are ignore, have their health issues ignored more than any other population. Mm. But we're going to run out of time, and I have to ask you this: What to this last question? It's a temporal question of the time. Vaccine equity, you know, the um, Google.org has been working with the CDC Foundation. I think has given a million dollars to address this issue of what's occurring in communities around trying to increase um, vaccine access. Um, we only have three minutes before they probably pull give yank me off stage. Um, so, so really quickly. Dr. Christensen, what are the issues that we need to keep front and center when we think about vaccine access? Dr. Smith, same question for you. The vaccines have to be not only available and easily accessible, but we have to address the concerns that the communities have that make them resistant to accepting a vaccine. And we have to be very transparent about it. Yeah. I, I would ditto both of those. And I would say we need to work on two parallel tracks. So one is to address the the concerns and, and reasonable concerns in, in many cases that, that have born out of the, the, um, the, the tragedies of how science and medicine have behaved in the past mm -hmm. and currently that make people sort of um, wary. So we have to do that. So addressing the people who aren't ready yet, how do we get them ready? But then a parallel track is to, there are people who are who do want it, but mm -hmm. are facing challenges and barriers to getting it. So we need to do both of those things and be pushing hard on both of those things at the same time. Getting That's people cool. who are already to get it, able to get it in all the ways that Dr. Christian was saying, making it easy, making it fast, making it available, having it be, promoted by folks that they know. I just worked at a um, at Alianza Hispana at a, um, mm -hmm. a, a, a vaccine clinic that was sponsored by a health center. So like we had 200 people come. They wouldn't necessarily go to a big mass center, mm -hmm. but they, mm -hmm. they, they went there because they, they trusted both of those partners. Um, so that's really important. And then of course, for those folks who are still having their concerns, we have to address them specifically and clearly and, and have a trusted voices um, that will do that. You've probably seen yes. that about us, between us, you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. which is fantastic with all, you know, black um, health professionals who are answering questions and talk frequently, you know, myths and misconceptions, really well done. And so that's the kind of thing I think we need. All right, so listen, this has been the hour that um, one of those amazing hours where I think we'll learn so much from the past, present, and talked about the future. I want to give both of you the very last word, and you have to make it 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> what, is your, what is your word of inspiration to all the, the people listening, the Googlers, non-Googlers, clinicians, non-clinicians, um, about health disparities, where we are now, and where we need to be? And I think more of an emphasis of where we need to be so that we can inspire individuals to continue the fight that you all have been on for so long. So um, Dr. Smith and then Dr. Christensen, 30, 20 to 30 seconds about um, um, why, why folks should get involved in this right now. Because we are at a crucible moment. Uh, we, are, we are at a time where we have looked into and experienced what this pandemic has done um, and we know that we can do better and we don't want to go back to normal because normal wasn't working for many people and many of our neighbors and friends. So this is our crucible moment to be able to, to build in a, an equitable rebuild in an equitable and I think um, this really inclusive way. So that's why I think you should get involved because you know now is the time we have an opportunity. Absolutely. And, and future generations cannot find us wanting for having lost the opportunity that this moment presents. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said. So I'm going to close and say you heard today from what I will consider the greats and you see why the work that they have done, path that they have blazed. Um, and this idea that these, their individual efforts have changed this country is kind of what always kind of inspires me to keep working. And I hope many of you who are watching feel that inspiration as well. And 
Um, I have to say, look, at, look, look them up, learn some more about their backgrounds and the other people we talked about who I think are part of this history around how this country has tackled health disparities. I'm literally ending right on time by the second, and I'm very <laughs> proud of that. Um, but again, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Christensen. Thank you to the sure. Thank you. The talks thank you for Google, having me. Um, and thank you all for uh, spending this hour with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye.